Everybody, I'm over here now. Okay. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful to see so many young people that we've seen today right on the forefront of this whole battle? And you're about to meet another one of them. Angela, we're going to talk about religious hostility in America, something that we've all become too familiar with. And we're going to uh, impanel a, uh, a group here to share with you. And let me just read quickly. You'll be hearing more about the story as part of the presentation. But Angela uh, Hildebrand, a Texas student, valedictorian, wanted to pray as part of her speech, uh, ran into all kinds of legal issues. Fortunately for her, the Liberty Institute stood in for her. They were successful in overturning the lawsuit against her just in time for her to give her prayer to a cheering crowd in a football stadium. You'll be hearing about that story in just a moment. Joining her from the Liberty Institute, which, by the way, is, is separate from, it's not a part of Liberty University or Liberty Council, it's Liberty Institute, is, Mike, is attorney Mike Johnson. Also joining our panel is to, uh, uh, Todd Starnes, who is the uh, author and host of Fox News and Commentary. Uh, Lieutenant General Jerry Boykin, former commander of Delta Force and executive vice president of the Family Research Council, and of course the president of the Family Research Council, Tony Perkins. Would you please welcome them all as they come to the stage? Good afternoon. I'm one of those young faces that Gil was talking about. <laughs> well, our founding fathers considered religious liberty our first freedom, and it was the bedrock upon which all our other freedoms would rest. Today, we hear a lot about supporting the freedom of worship from the Obama administration. But the founders correctly enumerated not a freedom or a right to worship, but a freedom of religion. They understood that our rights, which come from God, include the right and responsibility to live one's life according to the teachings and the principles of our faith. A man whose religious faith was repressed could never be a loyal citizen, since the state was usurping his first allegiance and costing him his primary freedom. This is one of, if not the most important distinctions that makes America an exceptional nation. America today would be unrecognizable to our founders. Our first, first freedom is facing a relentless onslaught from well-funded and aggressive groups and individuals who are using the courts, Congress, and the vast federal bureaucracy to suppress and limit religious freedom. This radicalized minority is driven by an anti-religious ideology that is turning the First Amendment upside down. Well, folks, it's time to turn it right side up. Yes. And to start the process, the Family Research Council has teamed up with Liberty Institute, and we have joined forces to take a bold, unyielding stand to protect and restore religious liberty in America. This includes opposing and exposing the escalating efforts by government bureaucrats to regulate religious freedom. So from the local district courts to the U.S. Supreme Courts and the halls of Congress, we will face each challenge head on to ensure that our First Amendment rights are protected. And our first step was two weeks ago to release the survey of religious hostility in America. Over 600 cases just in the last decade alone that shows just how great the threat is. And one of those cases is Angela's case. And we've got a short video that kind of sets the stage for the discussion that we're going to have with our esteemed panel of delegates this afternoon. If you'll turn your attention to the screens. My name is Erin Liu. I'm an attorney at Liberty Institute, and your religious liberty is under attack. 
It is graduation time for our nation's high school students, a time to thank teachers, parents, and for many students, it's also a time to thank God. But students at one Texas high school won't be able to do that publicly because prayer has been banned at their school. The school's valedictorian is joining the Texas State Attorney General in trying to reverse the ruling. You know, it was just so frustrating and disappointing to know that um, a judge had decided that they could rule and tell me what I could or could not say in my own valedictory address. And so that was really just disappointing to me um, that all the values and rights that I'd learned about in school were not being upheld. A little over a week before the Medina Valley High School graduation ceremony, an agnostic family brought a federal lawsuit seeking to prevent students from praying during their graduation ceremony. Outrageously, a federal district judge agreed with the family in order that no student could pray during the ceremony. He stated that students could not use words like amen, in Jesus' name, students couldn't even say the word prayer. However, he did allow students to kneel towards Mecca or to wear religious attire. The judge went so far as to say that if his order was not followed, he would enforce it by incarceration. This is a clear violation of the First Amendment. The government is not allowed to censor a student's private religious expression and to say what religious activity is allowed and what religious activity is prohibited. The judge has said, though, that if anybody violates this, they could face jail time. So this valedictorian that you represent, uh, if she goes ahead and does this, and this isn't overturned, and she mentions prayer and all the things she shouldn't be mentioning, according to the judge, is she willing to face jail time? Well, I mean, we're going to have to wait and see what the Court of Appeals says, but you're right. I mean, it literally, no, you you're have wrong. somebody going to jail for <laughs> praying if, if that were to happen, if contempt were to be pushed. And she's even received threats, and the police are having to protect her because she wants to pray at her graduation as part of her valedictory address. Um, you know, they told us that our, valedict our valedictory address is supposed to be about, you know, about us and our accomplishments thus far, and also things that we'd like to say to our peers. And I feel that all of those things directly um, relate back to my faith and also about um, the plan that God has for each of us. I'm so proud of my daughter for standing up for our First Amendment rights. So proud of our Medina Valley School District and board for fighting the good fight. And very, very thankful and proud to have Angela supported by the Liberty Institute and their fine team. Liberty Institute filed an emergency motion for intervention on behalf of Angela Hildenbrand. We found out the day before the graduation ceremony that the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals dissolved the temporary restraining order and that Angela could now pray. It was a great victory for the First Amendment and a great victory for Angela. Hallelujah. The federal court has lifted a ban on public prayer. Amen. The federal court has lifted a ban on public prayer. It's been a big victory for a high school valedictorian who was determined to say a prayer during her graduation speech. You know, it's just been a really great blessing to know that the court has made the best decision and that I'm going to be able to pray this evening as I wish. Lord, I thank you so much for the blessing of this day, and I just thank you for the amazing group of people that you surrounded me with. God, I thank you for the support of our whole entire community through this case hearing and also for Aaron and all the people at the Liberty Institute and my parents who've helped get me through the last couple of days. God, I thank you for the gift of your son and for the forgiveness that surpasses all understanding. And most of all, I thank you for your great love for us and for our great nation where we are free. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. fighting for your right to pray without government censorship. Angela, I'd like to begin with you in this uh, discussion we have about religious freedom. The, the, as you were moving toward graduation and anticipating the opportunity as the valedictorian to be able to, to pray, and you got the word that you would not be able to pray, what was the first thing that came into your mind? I honestly, I honestly, I didn't believe it whenever I first heard it. I was so alarmed and surprised that the um, federal district court judge would make a ruling that was so outlandish and just so contrary to everything that we as Americans stand for. And Mike, Mike Johnson, you, you, 
the Liberty Institute represented Angela, but you have been working on religious liberty cases for years, formerly with the Alliance Defense Fund. Uh, this growing body of evidence that suggests that religious freedom is under attack, Angela's case was not isolated. No, no, it wasn't, and that's the sad thing, Tony, as you well know. Uh, religious liberty is our first freedom, and it's increasingly being pushed out of the public square, out of our schools, even out of our churches. And, and there's a, a secularist movement in this country that uh, has launched an all-out assault. They're pulling out all the stops, as it were, right now, and the attacks are becoming more frequent, more hostile, more overt. Uh, they're saying things in the courts that we might not have imagined even a few years ago. Angela's uh, story, though, is a great example of what can happen when we stand for our rights. Because when the truth is presented, it usually does prevail. I mean, Liberty Institute has won 99% of our cases over the last 15 years. We've never lost one case. Yeah. Uh, not, could, that, could that in part be, when we look at this, uh, in this, which by the way, you can get a copy. We have copies. Mike has brought copies for everyone there at the back and the book tables. Um, the, this growing volume, could it be that finally there are Christians in the country that are standing up for their rights? Absolutely, and that's what this is all about. We want to draw attention, raise the alarms. I mean, th this is the full report that you can document, religioushostility.org. 600 examples. These are just ones that we documented. There are innumerable uh, examples all around the country, but it shows that this is a real problem. When we testified before the U.S. Senate, uh, Kelly Shackelford, our, our CEO and president in 2004, uh, Senators Kennedy and Cornyn asked us to begin documenting this to show, to, to have the documentation to show the evidence that this is, this is real. Regardless of what the mainstream media would like to tell us, uh, this is an all-out assault and it's only getting worse. But again, the good news is we can still win. We just have to have the courage to stand in the gap. Todd Starnes of Fox uh, News Radio, you have uh, been giving light to uh, these issues of religious freedom and the attacks on religious freedom. And I want to ask you this question is, I follow what you do, because I, I, and I hope you do too. If you, if you don't, Google uh, and make sure you put him on your homepage, uh, Todd Starnes. He does great work in bringing to light these issues. But is this in large part, because as Mike pointed out, we usually win when we stand up. Is this a form of intimidation? Oh, I, I think it absolutely is. And for the sake of full disclosure, I, I've got to say, Tony, uh, when you hear the phrase network reporter, uh, Jesus is not the first word that comes to mind. Uh, but uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, share with, uh, with the audience that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, Amen. and I am a journalist. And these, these issues are, are very uh, dear to my heart. And uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to take my pen and pad and tell the stories of evangelical Christians across this country that are facing persecution from their local, state, and federal governments. And as my brother here uh, just said, uh, there is absolutely, unequivocally, a war on religious liberty in this country. And it seems as though this government is, is bent on going after people specifically of the Christian faith. To give you an example, Tony, just this week I've covered two stories that I want to bring to your attention. Uh, as we know, we've been following the developments in the Middle East, and uh, with this, uh, this uh, anti-Islamic film that I have not seen, but I can tell you this, that uh, the Drudge Report, the big headline this morning is, Federal Authorities Investigate Christian Filmmaker because of this film. Earlier, earlier this week, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff telephoned this pastor in Florida who endorsed this film, and one of, our top, one of our nation's top military leaders asked this pastor to withdraw his support for this film. I want to be very clear. This is not about a film. This is about free speech and the fact that the government of the United States and the fact that any representative of the government of the United States or the military would go after a minister for something they endorsed, what's to stop them from calling the local uh, pastor of the First Baptist Church and saying, would you please tone down the, the sermons on, on gay marriage or something of that nature? So these things are happening, Tony. By the way, you can uh, listen to Todd Storm's uh, daily commentary on the American Family Radio, who's one of the sponsors of this year's uh, 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 Values Voter Summit. Uh, Speaking of this intimidation, I want to move to General Jerry Boykin, who uh, retired three-star general from the United States Army. You can look at his biography, just a, a tremendous American hero, uh, founding member of Delta Force, 
and he is now working at the Family Research Council as our executive vice president. Uh, we do have, uh, I, I have certain quotas at FRC. I will allow one member of the Army to be on my staff. Um, we, I know conservatives generally don't like quotas, but, you know, we, we want to help the disadvantaged. So the, uh, Now, we don't have much time, General, so we need to move on. <laughs> the don't laugh at him, it encourages him. <laughs> now, that's what my second grade teacher used to say to the class. But you recently had been invited to speak at West Point at a national prayer breakfast there at West Point. And as one who served for 36 and a half years honorably as a decorated war hero for our country, and your vision and focus on mentoring young officers to succeed in our military. You were asked not to come because of an atheist group that began to protest because of your overt Christian witness. Yeah, uh, let me say first of all, I've, I've spent 36 and a half years in the Army only to wind up working for a Marine Corps corporal. <laughs> Sergeant, there was a sergeant. I was uh, I was supposed to speak at West Point the first week of February of this year, and I was supposed to speak on uh, the importance of faith. It wasn't even a Christian uh, gathering or Christian audience, although I was going to do the second day. I was going to do a thing just for a Christian audience, but the address to the cadets there was about the importance of faith as an issue of leadership. It's even worse than Tony said. It was not only a series of uh, three atheist groups that protested my being there, but it was also a result of the a protest by the Council of American Islamic Relations, the leading, the leading Islamic advocate in America, which, by the way, is an unindicted co-conspirator from a trial in 2008 that declared that they are a front for the Muslim Brotherhood in America. Now, it, I want you to think about this. They asked me to withdraw because atheist groups and the Council of American Islamic Relations protested my being there, which I, I had to remind myself, you don't take flack until you're over the target. So I'm assuming I'm over the target and they are, they are very much afraid of the influence that I might have on the next generation of leaders. But I want to remind you of one thing. The week after Nadal Hassan killed 13 people, and I say 14 because one of the women was pregnant. The week after Nadal Hassan killed 14 people at Fort Hood, Texas, Fort Hood invited to come and speak to all the deploying units there, a guy named Louis Safi, who is a known operative with the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, you explain that to me. Well, I, I, that brings up a question. I'm going to throw this out to our panel. It is in this war on religion, this assault on religious freedom in this country, is Christianity being singled out? Yes. Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Okay, yeah. well, that was kind of a softball question. <laughs> the, that was so easy the audience could answer it. But go ahead, Todd, go ahead. Uh, Tony, I, I cover these stories every day. These are stories the mainstream media will not cover, but I cover them. And uh, one of those, the most uh, egregious examples happened just a few miles from here when a group of school children from a Christian school in Arizona made their field trip to, to the nation's capital and they gathered on the plaza outside of the Supreme Court building. These are 12 and 13 year old boys and girls, uh, just a handful of them. They gathered together, held hands and prayed in a circle in front of the Supreme Court. Capitol Police immediately marched over, interrupted their prayer event and informed the children that they were violating federal law by praying on the plaza of the Supreme Court. These children were forced to eventually stand in a gutter in our nation's capital, where they continued to pray for um, our nation's leaders. This mm. is just unacceptable in this nation. There, well, 
there, well, there's an incredible double standard because you see groups like the ACLU who bring lawsuits all the time against, for example, the Gideons or uh, some, some school children that, that want to bring a Bible to school or, or uh, invite someone to Sunday school class. At the same time, they represent uh, people of minority faiths, they say, and even radical uh, pornographers and, and all the other kinds of uh, illicit speech. They think that should be protected, but not religious speech. I'll tell you this. I was at the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit about two years ago in oral argument. The uh, lead attorney for the ACLU of South Carolina actually said this in open court to a federal appellate court. She said, the public mention of Jesus Christ in a public prayer is precisely the kind of evil that the Establishment Clause was designed to prevent. And, and even the, even the, the liberal uh, uh, media, mainstream media in the courtroom gasped, as you just did, because they can't believe that they're actually saying that. We know that they believe it. But now, as we said, all the stops are out. And so um, that they believe that they have free reign to do this and that we're just going to be silent and sit down and allow our speech to be censored and, uh, and, and shut down. So, and we're not willing to do that anymore. So what is driving this? What is driving with this, the crosshairs on Christianity? Why in particular is Christianity targeted? Uh, I want you all to hearken back and remember that um, one of the terms they used for uh, Adolf Hitler was a progressive. I didn't make that up. That's historic. I want you to also realize that Karl Marx said religion is the opiate of the masses. Karl Marx also said that my objective is to dethrone God and to destroy capitalism. I think that the people that are behind this would not call themselves Marxist, but I would tell you that they are following to the letter the Marxist model. America is moving rapidly to Marxism under the influence of these people that call themselves progressives. And their leading advocates and their leading front groups are organizations like the ACLU and the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has just recently gone after me again. Uh, that's the ones that labeled us as a hate group, a hate group that uh, employs a guy that stood over a man that just shot him and said, God told me not to shoot him. And we're the hate group. I want you to think about that. So why? Why is this happening and why is Christianity singled out? Because Christianity is the true light. It is the most powerful beacon of light in the world. Put it. Following that. Now, when you think about, when you think about the fact that we're the only nation in history that was, that was founded on the concept of inalienable rights, and then you look at the fact that what Karl Marx, Joseph Stalin, and Vladimir Lenin, as well as uh, Hitler himself, what they wanted to do was move everyone in the society away from the notion that there is a sovereign God that provides those inalienable rights so that you are dependent upon the government and the people in power. What you're seeing happen in America today is Marxism. They don't call it that, but it is Marxism. And they are destroying the concept of a sovereign God incrementally so that we ultimately become dependent upon God, I mean upon government, and Christianity is the most powerful force in America that goes back to the founding of this nation, Judeo-Christian principles, and they have to take God out of our society in order to insert government. Yeah. Tony. I want to get to Angela and ask her a, a question in just a moment. Mike, along those lines, I want to ask you this as an attorney. In the fact that the founders recognized religious freedom as the first freedom, in fact, in the, uh, the original Bill of Rights that came from the House, it was a standalone defense of religious freedom, recognition of it. Is that because everything else hinges on that, and without that freedom of religion, the rest falls? Yeah, look, look at the writings of the founders. Washington in his farewell address famously said, of, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. Adams said, our constitution is made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate 
to the governance of any other. What they understood was without religious freedom, you ultimately have no political freedom. This is the freedom upon which all the others rest. And, and what we're seeing today is this, uh, this, this onslaught. And, and uh, you know, I think part of the agenda, General, is, is this idea of postmodernism that now rules the day. And as you know, in postmodernism, uh, truth as the ultimate virtue in society is replaced by tolerance. And in a culture that is postmodern and that embraces that ideal, Christianity is the last voice standing that says, no, there is one way, one truth, and one life. And so that claim is inherently offensive and bigoted and tolerant and all the labels that they assign to us. But we have to let the light shine. We, we can't be cowered into silence because someone says they're offended by that. Guess what? The claims of Christianity have always been offensive. That's part of our faith. So we have to stand by that. It's our right. Todd, al al along those lines where we often hear about religion when it comes to public policy, that's what's um, offensive. But we're getting to the point in our society where just preaching the gospel is becoming at risk in this loss of religious freedom. Well, you bring up a very good point. And look, just going back to events just here in the past week where uh, we have seen the administration come out and say, we condemn anyone who denigrates uh, the religious faith. And, and they came out and they, uh, um, uh, in regards to this, uh, this anti-Muslim film. Well, that's, that's, that's well and good, but my question is, when has the administration condemned the anti-Christian films that are coming out of Hollywood? Uh, where, where is the... Where are the federal investigations into uh, shows like South Park, which has denigrated uh, all faiths? Uh, where is the outrage when people of the Christian faith are, are subjected to this, uh, this hum humiliation that's coming uh, out of Hollywood? And look, I, I think one of the most important things is to, again, shed light on these stories. And that's where, you know, uh, my website, toddstars.com, we cover these stories just about every day. And we tell these stories we, because you have to let people know what's going on in the country. These stories are, I mean, they're stacked up on my desk right now. Uh, the numbers of, of instances of people's, uh, people who have been uh, facing attack because of their faith in Jesus Christ. We just have a few minutes left for this panel, and I want to turn the corner and give you the, 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 the bright side of this, which gives me great hope, because I do think there is a recognition that has taken place in our country that our freedoms are under attack, and I want to ask Angela this in terms of uh, the younger a generation that's coming up that really has grown up with this hostility toward religion. I mean, you, uh, you know, schools have been uh, jettisoning anything to do with faith. Prayer is gone, the Bible is gone, Ten Commandments is gone. Now it's even at special events like graduation. What is happening among your generation? Is there a recognition of a loss of rights and is there a determination to regain them? I think that in America today, uh, throughout all of the generations and ages, that um, oftentimes there seems to be this domestic idea of Jesus, and we sometimes forget that he was an extremely controversial figure. And we need to realize that there is a war being, uh, a war being waged against our religious liberties, and I think that uh, my generation um, I have seen, you know, a lot of people my age, you know, we're starting uh, apologetics Bible studies so that we're able to, you know, like um, the, Peter says, at any moment to be able to give a defense for the hope that is within you. Um, you know, we're seeing groups of kids come together and be studying what it is they believe and be able to evaluate that and express that to others. And I think that there is an extremely hopeful future for this country. Mike, uh, Mike, as you work with these cases, do you see the same? Do you see those that are saying, you know what, I, I probably would have let this go before, but now I realize it's not just about me, but it's about all that we represent as Christians? This is about our perspective. We used to have the luxury of complacency, but we realize we don't any longer. The hour is late, the crisis is great. If we don't stand for these freedoms, they will be taken away from us. We, we didn't believe that was possible even a few years ago, but now we're seeing it. And by the way, Tony, I want to mention that the, the summary of the survey of religious hostility in America is available out on the table, and I encourage everyone to grab one of those and, and see this. 
have the documented evidence so that you can show other people, encourage and inspire them to also take a stand. Because as Angela uh, portrays here in Living Color, when you do that, you can win. And that's a win not only for us as individual, individuals, but a, a victory for the Constitution and our freedoms. T Todd, do you see this, as you do the reporting on this issue, do you see a strain of boldness that is beginning to emerge among Christians? I do, uh, Tony. One of the more exciting uh, stories I covered was when a group of Christian high school journalism students were at a secular gathering in Minnesota and a gay rights activist ridiculed them uh, from the platform. And uh, these young Christians, young high school Christian teenagers, uh, had the fortitude to stand up and walk out. Uh, and not stand there and listen to their faith being ridiculed. And they sp not only did they stand up and walk out, but they spoke up. And as a result of that, we were able to tell their story to a national audience. So look, I think we need to all understand, folks, as uh, the president uh, reminded us back on the campaign trail, when he, what did he say about folks of faith, the, the uh, uh, folks who cling to their guns and religion? Well, I'm here to tell you something, folks. I'm a gun-toting, chicken-eating, Bible-clinging, son of a Baptist, and uh, we're going to keep on telling the stories. Well, General, I'm sorry. That didn't leave you anything else to say. I, I want to. <laughs> I want to encourage you to go to religioushostility.org. Now that's the second phase of this. We've released this original, this uh, initial report, and as Mike said, you can get a copy, a condensed copy. This is just a summary copy. But now, what we're looking for are incidents, people to report their stories. This website, religioushostilities.org. That's where we want people to go to report those stories. Liberty Institute and others will be picking them up. Todd will be, I'm sure, kind of uh, cruising through that site to find more stories for the news, to give life to them, and then those cases which uh, could be successful in court, the Liberty Institute will be taking them forward. Angela, thank you so much for being with us. Your story, we appreciate your boldness and your courage. A nation to be able to turn all this around and there are people who are willing to help all of us and support us and get us the aid that we need like the Liberty Institute and you know all of the other organizations who are here who are willing to support anyone who is willing to stand up for this so we need to go to the polls we need to go to the booth and we need to vote with courage and stand for the truth Mike Johnson, Todd Storms, General Boykin, thank you so much. Please thank our entire panel.